here we are working on the next panel of the baby quilt I'm making for my brother's first kid. Um, this is going to be another hexagonal symmetry piece and it's going to be the hexagons and bars pattern just like this one behind my head. Hopefully I was actually pointing at the right thing. Um, there's a little bit of a time lag between what I see and what y'all see. So today I'm going to do this hexagons pattern and I'm going to start here at the corner and do diagonals across and back. And I've already got my matching thread um, with a knot on the end and it is beeswax. And I'm going to use my handy dandy thimbles to um, save my fingers. So if y'all have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Or if you're watching the replay, go ahead and drop your questions in the comments. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So I've already gotten started with this first set of points. It's just three points out of the entire hexagon. And what I did is pick up a little piece of the fabric at each one and go in and now I'm going to tie off onto the knot that I already had. And let me improve the lighting situation real quick. So now you can see even better what I'm up to and I'm going to move on to the next one. No need to clip the thread. I'm just going to pop on over and grab a point and then loop around my needle so that I make a knot coming out. So um, for those of you who have just joined us, uh, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm doing a stitching demonstration of the hexagons and bars pattern, uh, which I got from an origami tessellation. And um, this pattern comes from, if you do a hexagon twist on one side, and then open triangle twists on the other. And don't worry if you don't know what those mean. Uh, it'll become a lot more clear as the pattern emerges. So I'm taking all six of the corners of the hexagon that I've already marked on the paper and stitching them together. And so I have a pretty good idea of what this is going to look like because I did do some test patterns um, and by what this is going to look like I don't mean the general geometry I mean like the scale and everything so I did this tiny test pattern um, with a, a template that I had ordered um, which is the same size as the white piece behind me and um, this sizing um, the scale is not that great for fleece because it's going to be a lot of work a lot of teeny tiny parts uh, but then I also tested for the scaled up version um, using these squares in the same project and um, decided to um, do the hexagons at the same edge length scale. So I've got a pretty good idea of how it's going to turn out. And I'll just carry on doing these diagonals. 
to make sure I get all my thimbles back on because the easiest way to tear up your fingers is to do the entire thing with no thimbles. And so once I do this one and one more, I'll flip it over to show the reverse side. But um, yeah, that's the whole process. You grab a point and pull it close, making sure, especially with this fleece, that you're getting a um, piece of the, the inner weave part of the fabric instead of the fluff on the top because um, you don't want any of the points to just pull out. And then once you have all the points in a connected shape, you push your needle under the thread coming in. And I like to wrap my needle twice, the thread coming out, pull tight to make a knot. Um, but you can vary how you do that. If you have um, a knot at your first point in the shape, then you would simply tie your ending knot around the starting knot. So we've got this guy. can see the hexagons forming. And with this piece, you do need to do some rearranging of layers uh, the first time you flip it over, but it really keeps its layering um, as you go. So now I'll go and do the next row over. It looks like I skipped some in that last row, so I'll pick those up along the way. Basically, I wanted to do the diagonals so that you could see the progress quickly instead of going all the way across an edge before showing any progress. Because it's really nice to see the progress when there's um, multiple of these segments that are already stitched in the same area um, forming a block, uh, but it's less impressive when it's one big line. And so you might be wondering how I got into this smocking world and um, what is it useful for? Um, so I started smocking in um, 2018. Yeah, 2018. Uh, because I went to a origami conference. Uh, the seventh origami conference on science, math, and education. Seven OSME. And um, I was presenting my work on um, triangular and hexagonal grid mazes from single sheets of paper. And, and I did that work um, with Eric Domain and Jason Koo. And uh, while I was there, um, Adrienne Sack was talking about how there's these smocking patterns that have been around for centuries that have remarkable similarities to origami tessellations. And um, she um, gave her talk and then also um, taught a whole bunch of us to smock uh, in the evening after the scheduled presentations. So I was at the um, evening session, as it were, and uh, Adrian and I have been friends ever since. We submitted a paper, well, did a presentation 
together at um, the MOVES conference in New York um, in 2019 and uh, taught a workshop together at uh, Peacock, the origami convention um, through Origami USA, also in 2019. So, um, once she taught me smocking, I really um, gravitated towards it and um, started producing a ton of different smocking patterns. Um, and like to the extent that I now have three binders uh, completely full of sheets with at least one smocking pattern in each sheet. Um, and I've got a notebook um, in square grid and in triangle grid to keep all my patterns straight. So I've been working with smocking uh, for a relatively short amount of time, but I feel like it has a lot to add to um, math discussions and origami discussions and just generally um, in bringing uh, tessellated patterns uh, to the forefront in our culture. And um, I mean I think math is very important. Uh, it's important to not be scared of math uh, especially and especially for um, people who may not be seen as like your standard math nerd. So if you can find a way to bring the math in um, through the back door as it were, um, you can get a lot more people interested. And so there's not a ton of math when you're figuring out these smocking patterns, but um, you can bring math into it in a variety of ways. For example, uh, when I wanted to know how big of a piece to cut uh, for this panel, uh, because I want it to be a specific finished size, I needed to know um, how much it shrinks in each direction. And with this pattern, where it's a bit offset, from the underlying grid, um, like it's at diagonals to the underlying grid, um, then it's a bit hard to calculate the linear offset directly. But what you can do is find a repeating tile of the tessellation of the pattern and then mark, okay, how much of this is going to remain when the um, when the piece is sewn together. And so once you have your area um, starting and ending, you can then take the square root of those numbers and that will give you your um, distance starting and ending. So in kind of a average sense. So you can definitely bring math into this in a lot of different ways. Uh, this particular pattern uh, was one of the earlier ones that I translated from origami. And one of the features that made it work really well is that all six points here come together in one point. And so um, this technique of smocking works really well uh, when there's a bunch of points that all come together um, that don't leave any uh, room for things moving around um, and just generally can, um, can really fix things in place. And so one of the things that's really nice is if you have an origami tessellation that you folded on a background grid, you can mark the points that meet um, 
And with origami tessellations, the interesting thing is you can do this on either side. So you may start with what you consider the back and try to recreate the front uh, with fabric by finding points that come together on the back. Or you may figure out that, hey, uh, the points that come together are actually really nice on the front and I can emulate the back instead. And so there's lots of options when it comes to translating origami into smocking. So, this project uh, is my second quilt, uh, my second smocked quilt, rather, and um, since I'm making it as a baby quilt, I'm using fleece instead of satin, and the fleece is nice and soft. Um, you can stitch it pretty easily, and um, it's just generally good to work with. The only downside is it's uh, about 80 degrees outside. I'm working in the attic, and I have the AC turned off so y'all don't hear it for the video. <laughs> so um, this will last as long as I don't roast. And it's already over 80 degrees in here, uh, so We'll see. I'll hold out for a while for you. Um, but anyways, about the quilt. So I'm doing six different patterns. Um, three with um, four-fold symmetry and three with, with um, at least three-fold. Two of them are six-fold symmetry. And so this won't just be a um, nice thing to look at, it'll also teach math and symmetry from an early age. And uh, my brother is an engineer, and so I wanted to definitely incorporate some aspects of math and science into this quilt for his baby. So that's what's going on here. And uh, what I've been doing with the thread is I'm doubling it over, tying a knot at the, um, the open end, and then I'm doing a needle trick to thread the needle. I threaded the loop through the eye and then thread the tip of the needle through the loop. And that's entirely removable uh, without cutting the thread. That's another thing I learned from Adrian. And um, I use that trick for all of my smocking. So um, one of the cool things about this quilt that'll be different from my last quilt, uh, the, um, the one for and of course now I'm not remembering names, but uh, my last quilt was on the topic of research in color correction for underwater photography. And um, that one I had the entire thing smocked. Uh, this one I'm just gonna do smocked panels. Uh, so it's gonna be basically laid out like a um, two by three pane window frame and um, it's going to have flat pieces in between the smocked panels. So that'll be an interesting way to do it. Um, I've got all right angles this time and uh, it should be pretty quick to put together. So smocking can either comprise the whole or a part of a project, and uh, you can um, choose to have more or less smocking visible, um, depending on exactly what you want to do. Um, 
This one is going to feature the smocking uh, quite clearly, but you could definitely, for example, um, do a regular quilt and then have a smocked border. Um, you could have a smocked interior and then do a flat border. Uh, you could sew one of these panels, probably in a different kind of fabric, um, as the top of a dress. Um, there's many different things to do with smocking patterns and um, having them up on the wall or as a um, intellectual curiosity is uh, not the only use. So with this one, once I get this tied, I'll flip it over and show the progress now that we've reached the end of a diagonal. And I do expect it'll take me a lot longer to finish this than I'll be live streaming. But here is what we have so far. So we can take these little guys. Um, hexapods or whatever you want to call them. Uh, they look kind of like octopuses, but there's only six legs, so... And uh, you can see our latest diagonal was across here. And I'm going to keep on going. And as always, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat. Um, hi, Origami Master, welcome back. Um, it's good to see people coming back for multiple videos. And so I'm gonna just keep stitching away. So the um, the usual uh, way that I do the smocking is uh, with a podcast. So um, it's not as tedious as it looks as long as you have something to listen to or watch. Um, but depending on how you scale your pattern, it can definitely be uh, very time consuming to produce. Um, but I really love the final patterns, so I think it's totally worth it. So, um, it's interesting that uh, there's there's kind of two ways to think about this. Like you can think about this as folding or you can think about it as sewing points together. Um, and so folding would deal more with one dimensional lines and the points is a zero dimensional point. Um, and so there's interesting ways to translate between those two. Um, it's like, yes, you can see that I'm producing what looks like creases in the fabric, but um, it's very different from origami creases, and if I removed the thread, the fabric would go back to being flat, and you wouldn't be able to tell, um, other than maybe a little puckering at the points, um, that it had been stitched at all. Whereas with origami, once you make a crease, it's there forever, and you can always find it again, um, and use it for something else. The other great thing about smocking 
is that you don't need to fold the background grid. And that's a, a huge time saver. Um, gridding itself can take a long, long time. Um, and the other time saver with smocking is that you can easily rotate the grid. So this piece does have a rotated underlying grid. Um, you can see that um, there is more or less a straight line of these hexagons across the bottom. Um, but that's not aligned with the grid of the pattern. Um, and what I did is just align the repeating points of the hexagons with the edge of the paper uh, using my template. And so I have full control and choice over how that is aligned, which you also have full control and choice in origami, but you have to do some planning to make it happen. And um, I actually recently released a blog post um, over at gatheringfolds.com um, on how to rotate your grids in origami. And it's actually simpler than you might be assuming. Um, and there's quite nice formulas for both uh, square grids on squares and triangle grids on hexagons. Um, so that is a fun crossover to the world of origami. But uh, yeah, lo lots of smocking to do. And so this is panel number two of six that I'm doing for this quilt. And they're all about this level of complexity. I would call this an easy level of complexity. Um, they um, are patterns that generally stay in place uh, once you make them, uh, once you stitch them, rather. And so they're appropriate for a baby to play with, for example. And then with, the, with this particular pattern, um, the baby can choose to twist the hexagon one way or the other and play with that as a feature of the blanket. So it has built-in interactions and um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the kid on the blanket. And this baby has not been born yet, so I have no clue about the uh, gender or um, name of the kid, but we shall see. So if you have any questions for me, uh, I'm happy to answer. Uh, there's the live chat, or if you're watching the replay, uh, drop a comment in the comments. I'm approaching the end of another row. So at that point, I'll turn it over and we can take a look, see how far we're, we've come, see how far is yet to go. And if you're looking to use this pattern in your own projects, um, I call it hexagons and bars. And you can look for that in gatheringfolds.com. Um, I'm pretty sure I also have it up at um, Origami USA's um, online store, The Source, and it's also up on Etsy under Gathering Folds. So, one more set of points, and there'll be time to flip, 
and check out where we're at. And it doesn't really matter what order you pick up the points in. I like to go around um, either all clockwise or all counterclockwise, but in this case uh, the easiest point to pick up was somewhere in the middle. So I just grabbed that, grabbed the one on the end, and then got the other two. And so I'm going to pull tight before I wrap around my needle and pull all the way through. And so we've got another row. I'll pull out all of the legs there. So what I was saying with the twisting is you can have them the standard way or you can pull them up into a pointy twist. And I think either one would be fun for a baby. So that's one small piece done, um, and you can see the end product is going to be closer to this size, so I've got a long ways to go. But let's continue onwards. So one of the things that I'm doing when I'm deciding which points to do next is I want to close any um, gaps with neighboring features uh, that have already been stitched first. So when I'm going up this way, I'll go clockwise around the hexagon, and when I'm coming back down, I'll go counterclockwise. And it doesn't matter much, uh, and it matters not at all for the end product, uh, but it can be easier to find your points uh, for the last few if they are um, further from what you've already stitched.
And so, just working my way up. Should probably have like a cha ching noise every time I finish a group. That'd be cute. So I guess one of the things that I haven't discussed yet today is um, exactly why I do what I do with my thread, why I use the thimbles, why I use the beeswax conditioner. And that's because um, for the thimbles, your fingers will wear out if you do a lot of smocking, uh, especially if the back end of your needle is a bit sharp, um, you will have raw fingers unless you, for example, already have calluses from rock climbing or some other um, sport where, or craft where you build up a lot of calluses in your fingers. And so the, uh, the pink thimbles, the rubber grips, make it really easy to pull the needle through, uh, even in tighter situations. So I'm able to hold on to the needle better. Um, it doesn't uh, make dents in my fingers anymore. And uh, the leather thimble with the metal um, plate is for pushing the needle through in particularly heavy situations. And that can be a real lifesaver with certain kinds of material. For example, the um, vegan leather or vegan something or another, vegan suede that I was using for the blue pillow, the herringbone pillow, um, that I did not have the thimbles yet. I want to say, and it was a royal pain. It took all day and my fingers were definitely in pain by the end. So with fleece it doesn't matter as much because it's really easy to work with, um, but for something like um, faux suede you're definitely going to want to have thimbles or needles that are specifically made for working with that material. And so um, that's what's going on with those. And then for the beeswax, um, I use that as a thread conditioner, which means that I get fewer knots 
uh, unintentional knots while I'm sewing. So I got mine in a little bar off of um, bar as in the shape of the beeswax, not the the place where I got it, um, off of Etsy, and um, it just comes in this little wrapper, and you can use it as much as you want. You can see I use this one end, uh, but the rest of it is unused. Um, and that will really help um, avoid tangles while you sew. And so you just put it over the beeswax, hold it down with a finger, and pull it through. Uh, you can also find thread conditioner in little tins where you hold your thread down with a finger and pull through. It's the same idea. You can also get these in various scents, um, but I like just the plain beeswax. And then, as usual, I put my thimbles back on and continue. And since I already have a knot at the end, I just pull through to the knot and carry on. And now I'll make a knot around the starting knot. And just make sure that everything's pulled tight. And you might need a second knot to keep everything in place. Go around. And get these small segments at the corner. And grab this guy here. And since we're at the end of the row, go ahead and flip it over. And like you don't have to flip it over and arrange your layers at the end of every row, but it's nice since I'm doing this live to show you how it's going. Um, and thank you for those of you who've been watching the whole time. Um, it's it's great to have an audience, 
and uh, yeah, th thanks for learning about smocking with me. I think that's where I'm going to conclude it for today. I'm going to be finishing this up while listening to podcasts. Um, if you want to see the end product, check out my Instagram stories over at Gathering Folds. Thanks, y'all. Bye.